Hello, this is Marcel from ITI 1121. As you can see in the back here, I'm done marking the final exam for ITI 1121 version 2018. Um, I'd like to spend 80 minutes with you, sort of like a lecture, uh, going through the solution for the final exam and pointing out at places where some students had challenges uh, and the hope is that this is going to be useful for your subsequent courses so that you can fix some of these mistakes okay so let me go here okay so already if you go to the uh, course website um, so from my web page you go to introduction to computing you go to examinations and at the back at the, at the bottom of the page you see that i've already uploaded the french and english versions of the questionnaire for our final exam and and the plan is now to go over the uh, solution Okay, so first question was this class called Boing. Okay, so what were the challenges here? Um, some students thought that this, uh, this particular class would not compile. I can already show you that it does. So we go here, you have exactly the same version of the class Boeing as you had in your final. If I go to Q1 over here, Java C, Boeing.java, it does compile just fine. So what were some of the reasons? Well, some students look at the code and saw that um, the methods were not static, should not be a problem because in the main method, we are creating an object of the class Boing. The local variable, reference variable Boing, is pointing at that object. And we will start the computation by calling BAM. Okay. Um, let's see how it works. So we're calling the method BAM of the object designated by Boeing. So it's this method BAM. There's a try catch block here where we call the method BOOM. So we're calling the method BOOM. Method BOOM does something a little bit peculiar. Um, it says if true, throw a new exception. It's a runtime exception. Okay, so here true is always true. Therefore, we will always go into the if and we will always throw this exception. Now that the exception has been thrown, it means that the method boom terminates abruptly. We are not printing the message saved. We will never come back to the method boom the control returns here and because boom was called in a try catch block where the catch clause has a parameter of type runtime exception, the same type, we're catching the exception. So therefore we will print a message. Here we're printing E. E designates the object that was thrown so we're expecting that it's going to print java lang runtime exception ouch we caught the exception so it means that we're back into the normal uh, flow of control the execution resume after the try catch there's no need to have a finally there's not always a finally so here, the execution resume after 
the try catch. We're in normal mode. We will be printing finished. BAM terminates. Return the control here and we are done. Okay, let's let's look at this right here. If we execute the code, Java Boing, it's exactly that. Okay. Question two. So question two was about um, a class called Alpha, a class called Beta, and the interface Gamma. I would really advise you to draw the classes. When you have, you're facing a question like this, do the UML class diagrams. So we have Alpha as the parent class. We have Beta as the child. Beta extends Alpha right here. And Beta extends Gamma. Okay, so so here it was important to realize, to, to see that there's no connection between alpha and gamma. It's beta that's implementing gamma. So we selected these names, alpha, beta, and gamma, um, to be a little bit abstract so that you don't try to guess what it does, but you do give us the right answer based on your understanding of the code. When you're, you're working with a problem like this, I would suggest that it would be a good it could be a good idea to to actually substitute these names with names that you're familiar with and here the superclass could be something like shape the subclass is circle and the interface could be comparable so what does it say it says every circle is a shape but not every shape is a circle. Circles are comparable, so they have a compare to method, but shape has nothing to do with comparable, so you can't call a method compare to. If you have an object of the class alpha or shape, or if you have a reference variable of the type of the superclass. Okay, so we start here A, um, we're creating an object of the class alpha, we're storing the reference of that object in a reference variable of type alpha. So very straightforward case where the type of the reference is the same as the type of the object. We're calling a method toString because when print line receives the reference of an object, it systematically calls uh, the toString. In this case, it's the toString method in the class alpha. B, we're creating an object of the class beta, and we store the reference of that object in a reference variable of type alpha. We can do this because alpha is the superclass, so all the betas are alpha. So that works. And we're calling a method to string. Here it's important to, to know, as always, that in Java, um, it's a late binding mechanism, or sometimes we say dynamic binding that occurs. It means it's the method that's found in the object, not in the class that was used to uh, give a type for the reference. So here, the method 
to string that will be called is the one of the object. It's an object beta. It has a method to string. It's that one that was used. Here, we're creating an object of the class alpha. That makes sense. However, we cannot store the reference of that object in a reference variable of type beta. We can't because alpha is more general than beta. Again, going back to our example, shape and circle. If we can create an object of the class shape, we cannot store the reference of that object into a reference variable of type circle because not all shapes are circle. Some shapes could be square, triangle, etc. So here it does not compile because we cannot assign the reference of alpha to a reference variable of type beta. Here we create an object for D of the class beta. We store the reference of that object into a reference variable of type beta. So the types are the same. We call the method to string it prints beta. Next example, we create an object of the class alpha. That's valid. We store the reference of that object into a reference variable of type alpha. That works. However, there is no relationship between alpha and gamma. So therefore, when the compiler sees this, calling the method gamma for a reference of type alpha, that creates a compile time error. Next example, we create an object of the class beta. That's fine. We store this in a reference of type alpha. That works because beta is a subtype, a subclass of alpha. That works. The object has a method gamma because the class beta implements. However, we're using A4, a reference of type alpha, to designate the object. Therefore, this line here is not valid. It's because A4 is of type alpha. There's no relationship between alpha and gamma. Again, using our example of shapes, that would be superclass shape, subclass circle, circle implements comparable. So I can use a reference of type shape to designate a circle. A circle has a method compared to. However, when I'm using a reference of type shape to designate the circle, I cannot use the method compared to because there's no relationship between shape and comparable. Next example, we create an object of the class beta. We store this in a reference of type beta because beta implements the interface gamma. It's valid to make the call and at runtime when we make the call, we're getting printed on the screen gamma. H trying to create an object using the name of an interface does not work, does not compile. I, creating an object of the class alpha, 
that works. However, we cannot store the reference of that object into a reference of type gamma because there's no relationship between alpha and gamma. Okay, no relationship there, does not compile. Creating a beta because beta implements the interface gamma, we can actually use a reference of type gamma. When we call the method gamma, it prints gamma. I think overall this question was well, uh, well answered by most of you. Question three should have sounded familiar because it's exactly the same one as the one we had for the midterm. It was not particularly well done for the midterm, so we thought we would have a go at it again. So here the question is asking you to use the algorithm seen in class to give the infix representation of a postfix expression. This algorithm uses a stack. What it does basically is when it reads numbers, these are pushed onto a stack. Because we're constructing a string representation, these elements will actually be strings. When the algorithm reaches an operator, it takes out of the stack two operands. The first thing that comes out is the right sub-expression. Like this. And then we're pushing back onto the stack the result of concatenating a parentheses left operator right parentheses and this. This algorithm must preserve the order of operation. Because it's a very naive algorithm, all it can do is systematically adding parentheses around each of the sub-expression, even if they're not needed, because the algorithm that would be able to understand the priority of the operations is a more complex algorithm than the simple one we, we saw in class. So therefore, what we were expecting was a string where all of the parentheses have been added, including the external ones. Question four. So question four is about range and iterator. So it, uh, it actually was inspired from Python, where in Python you could say something like for i in range 5 print i. And range is a function that generates uh, a list having the value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and they're printed. So here we wanted to have a object-oriented version of this, a Java version of this. Um, it's also a question that should have reminded you of assignment number three, where we had these cubes and the cubes were uh, having the a method next and the method next was allowing the cube to, to be transformed, to do some rotations. And, and the cube needed to memorize where it was in the sequence of rotations. For that, 
it was using a an instance variable that would memorize the iteration number and that information was used to to make the next move so here it's the same idea okay so so here you have the uml for an interface we've also seen the interface iterator for lists when you see the keyword can be seen as this also calls for an interface so because range implements iterator we can use a variable of type iterator to designate the object range this object now has a method has next and next at the beginning the object has not started the iteration we we ask are there more elements if it says yes we call next the first time it should return the value zero and it should memorize some element of information that allows it the next time for the next call to the method next to return a one and the next call returns a two so this really calls for some good object oriented programming design so the solution that i'm proposing you looks something like this so there's the interface iterator it does not have a type parameter because the elements that are returned are always ints integers so it has next uh, as a return value which is a boolean next as a return value which is an int range implements the interface iterator which means it should have has next and next in the constructor i'm receiving a an input value if it's negative i decided here that it's not legal i'll just throw an exception i need to memorize the value of this parameter because this is the the upper bound it's the number of times that the method next can be called so this number equals number in my instance variable number i'm storing this value i also need to have an instance variable that will allow me to mem memorize to remember how many times the method has been called initially the value is zero as long as the value of iter is smaller than number as next we'll say true we'll say yes you can call me again i've not been called the maximum number of times when iter reaches number it will return false and we should not call the method next again if we do iter is now equals to number the method next will throw illegal state exception so you remember that initially iter has a value zero the first time it's called we're going to return zero and increment iter to one the second time that the method iter is called we return the current value one and it's incremented it becomes two it's called again it returns the two it's incremented it has value three it's called again it returns the three it's increment incremented four etc okay so let me show you the code okay so we go here this is range this is q4 so i is of type iterator i'm creating a range object storing i as long as there are more elements call next let's go to q4 java c q4 java q4 
through four. That works. If we push the value here to 10, let's compile this, let's run. It does the work. Now, we've used the, the concept of, of iterator with uh, our list recently. And so many of you felt the need to have a supporting list. So I've seen some students that would declare a static nested class node within range. And in the constructor, they would store the values 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., all the way to number into nodes of this linked structure. I've seen some students using a list, a linked list, and I've seen some students using um, even an array. I'm going to show you. So here's a, a different implementation for range. Um, to me, it's not the preferred implementation. It will work. So what it does is it still has a counter that memorizes how many times the method next has been called, but it's using a reference to an array of integers. And in that array, there will be the values that need to be returned for each calls to the method next. So here in the constructor, I'm receiving the value number. I'm using this as the size of the array. So I'm creating an array of size number and the instance variable values is pointing at it. We're putting initial value in that array for i equals zero to number, values of i equals i. So you see something here where at position zero, I will have the value zero. At position one, I will have the value one. Position two, the value two, etc. So here, has next, will return true if the number of times that we call next is smaller than the size of the array. In the method next, if the method next has been called number of times, that is if iter equals value.length, we're throwing an exception. Otherwise, return the value of the array designated by values, return the value designated by iter, and then increment iter so that the next time it will return the value found at the next position. But here, clearly, you, you, you see this array for every position has exactly the value of the index. So there, there's no need, there's no point to store this array. All we needed to memorize was actually iter. We would get the very same result here by returning the value of iter. This array was not needed. Anyways, that was working, but here this implementation and or all the ones that were using linked element or additional data structures were consuming some memory and it was not needed. Okay, so question five. Question five is about the uh, binary search tree. It was a question that was well answered. So we have the, the tree here that was created. Um, we can actually create one just to see the mechanics. So an object of the class binary tree is created. Initially, it's empty. We're adding four. Four becomes the root of that tree. You remember that a binary search tree is a tree such that all the keys to the left of a node, any node, are lower than the value stored in the node, 
And all the values that are to the right are values that are larger than the value stored in the node. And this is true for all the nodes. So here, if we're adding eight, because eight is greater than four, it has to be stored to the right. So eight is added there. We're adding two because two is smaller than four. It has to be to the left. We're adding six. Six is greater than four, but it's smaller than eight. It must be to the left of eight. We're adding seven. Seven is larger than four, smaller than eight, and larger than six. So seven is here. We're adding five. Five is larger than four, smaller than eight, smaller than six. Five is added here. Adding nine. Nine is larger than four, larger than eight. Nine is added here. Adding one. One is smaller than four, smaller than two. And three. Three is smaller than four, larger than two. Three is added here. The next question is about balanced trees. So a tree is balanced if the nodes that do not have two children are located on the last two levels. So this tree is balanced. And the depth or the height of a tree is the depth of the deepest node. Here it's three. And then we were asking you to print the labels of the nodes of the tree using the pre-order, the in-order, and the post-order strategy. I'm reminding you here, so if we go here, we're at question five, binary search tree. So in a class binary search tree, I have a method visit that receives the reference of a node and it simply prints the value. When we're doing pre-order, we're starting with the root. We're calling the recursive method pre-order. The first thing that it does is visit. Then it goes left, then it goes right. And this is true for every node. First visit, then do everything to the left, do everything to the right. The in-order traversal starts at the root. It traverses the left subtree, then visit the current node, then it goes to the right. And this is true for every node. Do everything to the left, come back, visit, do everything to the right. Finally, in the post-order traversal, we also start at the root, but we do everything to the left, do everything to the right, then visit. Let's compile this and see how it goes. Q5, Java C, Java Q5. So this is the pre-order traversal. The in-order traversal prints the values in order as the name suggests in a binary search tree. And this is the post-order traversal. Okay. Question six. So, as always, but in particular this year, we've been insisting quite a lot on the importance of understanding references and, and how method calls are working. Um, on Piazza, there was a, a quiz called swap or test swap, something like that. If you search for the keyword swap, 
you will find it. If you attended the review session for the, for the midterm, um, we also looked at the importance of uh, reference variables and their impact when we're doing method call. And, and this question was not well, well done by most students. So most students didn't get the marks for this question. They got partial marks, half of the marks for their answer. Okay, so this is a class called test stack. It has a static method test and a main method. In the main method, we're creating a linked stack object. We're pushing some values. We're printing the content of the stack. We're calling test and we're printing after. So in details, we're executing the method main. It has its working memory. The working memory for main has the parameters. Here there's one, it's called args, but it's not playing a big role in our example. And it's the local variables. So in the working memory for main, there's a local variable s. We're creating a linked stack object. So the implementation here is not particularly important, so I will draw a abstract representation just like this. But the important element is that S is a reference variable, so it's pointing at the stack object. We're calling the method push of the object designated by S, so we have A at the bottom, called push, adding a B, calling push, adding C, calling push, adding a D, printing the label before, printing the content of the stack. So here, that prints this representation where top indicates where the top element is. We're calling text. So the method test also has its working memory. So it's the working memory for test. This is here the working memory for main. Each method has its own working memory. The working memory is the parameters. So here S and the local variable here, temp, test, and temp. When we are calling test, we take the value of the actual parameter, so it's the reference, and it's copied to the parameter, the formal parameter of test, so test, has a parameter S, which is pointing at that stack. So S in the working memory of test and S as a local variable in main are two distinct variables, but they're reference variables that are pointing at the same stack. We're executing test, so we're creating a link stack object and temp will be pointing at it. The stack designated by S is not empty, so we're calling pop on the object designated by S. So we remove D and it's pushed onto the temporary stack. So D is pushed there. It's not empty. So we take C 
out of S and we push it onto the stack designated by temp. Pop from S, push to temp. Pop from S, push to temp. So right now, the stack designated by S, the parameter for test, is empty. The stack pointed by temp has all the elements in the reverse order. We execute S equals temp, which means take the value of S, the value of a reference variable is the reference. Therefore, at this point, we have that S and temp are both pointing at that particular stack, the one that contains all the elements in the forward order. And the parameter S from the method main is still pointing at an empty stack. We're done with test. Return the control here. Print after calling the to string and it will print this representation because the stack designated by s is empty now i've seen some students um, saying that s is null after a call to test that's not true that's not true there is a big difference between a reference variable that has the value null, which means S is not pointing at an object, and S pointing at an object of the class stack, which is empty. If S is not empty but is pointing at a stack object, S dot is empty, will work and will return true. We can call the method is empty of the object designated by s. But if s is null, this would cause a null pointer exception. Okay, very, very important. Let's look at the code. Okay, so test stack from Q6. Okay, in a method main, we're creating a stack. It's designated by S local variable. Printing calling test oops I don't have the right implementation here let me revert this to what it was okay I actually did a video for the French section first and we talked about this already okay so here temp temp i'm taking things out of s i'm pushing this to temp okay so s temp temp moving everything to this at the end saying s equals temp like so okay Compile, run. Okay, we do see that before 
calling test, we have four elements and T is on the top after the stack designated by S is empty. Okay, so all of this because of that line here. So many of you gave an answer where A was now the new top element. And, and you said so because if we go to our drawing, oh, okay, like this. Okay, because the stack designated by S and temp um, contains the elements in the reverse order. Okay, so I now realize that you couldn't see my drawing, you were seeing my, my face actually, okay. All right, so in class, if I had asked you to um, fix the problem, I have a feeling that many students would have said, you have to return something, so stack, String. So here probably you would not say this, but you would have said something similar to this. And you would have said here, S has to receive something. And, and here you know that, um, yeah, that should be the right thing because temp is pointing at a stack that now contains the element in the reverse order. Okay. Java C test dot Java. Okay, so it does the job. It does the work. However, when we're programming using object oriented programming, if we're receiving the reference of an object and this is not an immutable object, it's an mutable object like a stack is, it's expected that you will not return the result of the transformed object. You will actually transform the object in place the way we did actually. Okay, so here we're going back to where we were. So I now need to put the things back into the original stack. If I go to the iPad. Okay, so S has the elements in the right order. But clearly, if I were to remove things from S, from temp or S, because they're pointing at the same stack, and pushing them back here, I would reverse the order. And that was probably not the, um, the intent. So if the intent was that test was a method that would reverse the order of the elements, probably I needed a, an additional stack. So stack of string, I'm gonna call it forward. Forward equals new linked stack for string objects. I'm going to take everything out of temp. I'm going to put it into forward. And I'm going to take everything out of forward.
taking out a forward and pushing back to S. Okay, that that does the job. I've been able to reverse the order of the elements, the ones inside the stack designated by S, where S is this local variable to the main method. Okay, so I believe this is a very important message, so I hope that um, you're gonna fix this. If you don't quite understand, just book an appointment with me. Like, let's talk about that. Let's make sure that you get this right. Okay, question number seven. Okay, so question number seven is the recursive method called test rec. So some of you um, were under the impression that it was not compiling this class um, because it was lacking a constructor. But as you remember, when, when there's no constructor, there is a default constructor. In this case, what it would do is the instance variable head would be um, initialized to null, which is okay. This is a singly linked list and size would be zero because it's an int, the default value is zero. And, and this is correct. Also, some of you had a, a bit of a hard time to see because uh, it was quite compact on this representation. Uh, there were actually two test track methods. One is public, has two parameters. It's calling the recursive method text, test rec that also has i and j, but it also has current, which is a reference to a node. In the first call, we're passing the value of head. Okay, so here xs is a reference of type linked list. A linked list object is created and we're adding at the end 10 values 0 to 9 so this is the linked list object has a variable head and a variable size initially this is null this is 0 in our example xs is pointing at this object. We're calling the method add last of the object designated by xs. It means add last is executed on that object. A node object is created. It will store the value 0. And now we have 1 element in this linked list. So 10 values will be added like this. So we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and nine. Okay, drawing all my objects. And this is a singly linked implementation. The nodes have an instance variable next pointing to the next element. 
like this. So we're printing the list. It's going to print this. We're calling the method test rack of the object designated by XS. So a method test rack is called for that object. The values of the parameters are two and five. What it does, it calls the method test rec that has three parameters. So return, so return test rec. That method has a parameter. Here I'm calling it C so that it's more compact. And when we're making the call, we're passing the value of head. So C is pointing there. And the values for the parameters are two and five. So we're calling the recursive method test rec. So test rec as a parameter. Okay, so and it's pointing there. It's received two and five. We're executing the method. Is j equals to zero or smaller? No. Is i less than or equals to zero? No. So what we execute is return. Test rec. We're passing c dot next. And we're passing i minus one, j minus one. We're executing now test rec. It's a method test rec that has a parameter c. The value that it receives, so we called c. In that called, c was pointing on this node. Dot next was here. So in the recursive call, c is pointing there. We received one and four. So is j equals to zero or is it less than zero? No. Is i less than or equals to zero? No. So therefore, again, we're executing this. So we're going to say return test rec passing c dot next where c is this variable and then i minus one zero j minus one executing test rec so method test rec has a parameter c when we made the call we passed c dot next so c is pointing here dot next is there so therefore we're pointing there we receive zero and three we're executing test rec is j less than or equals to zero no is i less than or equals to zero? Yes. So therefore, we're executing this line. So return one plus test reg of <coughs> c dot next. i stays the same, so 0, and j is decremented. 
executing test rec as a parameter C here C is pointing at that node dot next is this so we're getting this we've received 0 and 2 executing is j less than or equals to 0 no it's not is i less than or equals to 0 yes return 1 plus test rec of c dot next i j minus 1 executing test rec as a parameter c pointing at this node as a as value i equals 0 j equals 1 executing is j less than or equals to 0 no is i less than or equals to 0 yes executing return 1 plus test rec for c dot next i j minus 1 executing test rec passing oh, yeah passing so c dot next so c in that call is pointing there we received zero and zero when we're executing the code is j less than or equals to zero yes return one we're done with this particular call we return one transfer the control back to where we were we receive one adding one we return two we're done return the control where we left we receive two we're adding one we return three we're done with this call return the control where we left we receive three we're adding one makes it four return four we're done return the control here return what we receive we receive four return four we've done with this call return the control here return what was received we receive four we return four we're done with this call the recursive private method returns the control to the public method test rec it returns four okay so overall this question was was well answered as well final question question eight so here this was about your ability to change the connections between the nodes accordingly here was saying you can't just change the reference of the values this was not acceptable what we wanted was that you would change these links in the linked structure so here this is the proposed implementation so this is a method swap first swap first is called on a list that has already 
been initialized has all the characteristics that it needs when a linked list that has a dummy node is created the dummy node was created and size was zero when an element was added size became one and the element was added after the dummy node if there was another call to add another element was added size becomes two so you're assuming here that size and the dummy node are all correct so if you are to swap the elements of a link structure there has to be at least two elements so first thing to do is to check if size is less than two throw this ex exception and then we do the job so many of you or a good number of students um, did not use local variables so you did all the work by doing things like head dot next dot next equals head dot this and that and when it worked it worked and you got all your points but really it was very difficult to mark just for the French section and section C it took me nine hours to mark that and it's very difficult to read the code if you were in the industry and you're producing code like that I don't think you would be appreciated as a colleague I think that the code would is very difficult to to read it's very difficult to make sure that it does the right thing and even for you a few months after you've done the work it would be very difficult to read so the better approach is to define local variables to do your work so here i'm defining or i'm declaring first second and after first will be pointing where head dot next is pointing so first it's pointing here second will be pointing at first dot next so second will be pointing there and after will be pointing at second dot next so it will be pointing there first thing i'm doing here is head dot next equals second head dot next equals second second dot previous equals head second dot previous equals head second dot next equals first second dot next equals first first dot previous equals second first dot previous equals second first dot next equals after mm, let's do like this first dot next equals there after dot previous equals first after dot previous equals first and we're done if we now traverse the list starting with head we go to neck we go to next so, whoops sorry undo undo we go to next we arrive here if we print elements.value it's it's this b we now follow next we have a and if we follow next we have c 
we could have done the other way around. I could start here and I'm here. I print C. I go to previous. I print the A. I go to previous. Print the B. I go to previous. I am back to the dummy note. The beauty of the dummy node implementation is that it works without creating all these special cases because every node has a node before and a node after. So the code that I've proposed there actually works for a list that would contain only two elements. Let's try. So First, we'll be pointing here. Second, we'll be pointing at first.next, so it's pointing there. After is pointing at the node that follows second. The node that follows second is the dummy node. So after is pointing there, which is here. So head dot next equals second. Second dot previous equals head. Second dot next equals first. Second dot next equals first. First dot previous equals second. First dot previous equals second. First dot next equals after. First dot next equals after. After dot previous equals first. After dot previous equals first. If, you fo if we follow the elements, starting with head, dot next, we have the B, dot next, we have the A, dot next, we have the dummy node, we're done going in the other direction starting at the dummy node following previous we have a following previous we have b following previous we are back to the dummy node it works when there are two, there are three. When there are more elements, it always works. So really use local variables, designate all the nodes that are involved in the change. Your code will be clearer. And one note to conclude, here you were asked to exchange the order of two elements of the linked structure. This is a doubly linked structure. So in order to make this swap, you were required to change one, two, three, four, five, 
six. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you have less than that, you're missing some important links. Okay, so that's it. I hope that um, you will find this solution useful. I hope that you will fix some of the issues that uh, you encountered in the final exam. It's not very often that we have a chance to review the solution of the final exam, but with this video, hopefully you will take this opportunity. Hope you enjoy your ITI 1121 class. Hope to see you around on campus um, this winter or during your studies. Really wish you all the best and have a productive summer. All right, take care.